Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape oil painting demonstration. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy, and the painting I'm bringing you today is called Morning by the Bay. It's a 10 by 14. I painted this back in March, maybe April. Um, the uh, the board itself is a one of these underneath this um, burn umber layer you're seeing is a um, a failed old older painting so art historians in the future get your x-ray cameras out and go for it um, before I forget and I almost always do uh, please like this video if you like my channel and you like my videos um, that just helps uh, YouTube um, to uh, point people in the direction of uh, what I do here um, yeah also, uh, I also forget to, to, to do this as well. This is going to be in my store. And those of you that have purchased paintings from my store, especially um, people that are my YouTube followers, thanks so much for the uh, support. I really appreciate it. And I'm just thrilled to see uh, my paintings getting to people's homes. I've had some great comments and remarks from people um, that have uh, purchased paintings and were just thrilled with the paintings and uh, you know one remark I get consistently is that it looks so much better than in real life than it did on the screen and uh, this is one of the things that drove me to actually creating f paintings in the physical real world because uh, I take about as good a photo as you can take of a painting I've spent years and years getting good at that and I'm very very um, picky about getting every brush stroke um, into that photo and the color is completely accurate and on and on and on and um, but as good as those photos look as good as these images look uh, they're still not they don't look as good as the actual painting I can tell you that anyway um, so uh, you just saw me do the drawing stage where uh, over the burnt number background color I'm basically using a quick dry ivory black to do the what I call the drawing stage what a lot of people would refer to as an underpainting stage and um, uh, the the reason for the difference the variance in tones is because I use a uh, an oil to thin the paint um, for to give me you can't get that many values off of it um, maybe three or four different values but uh, sometimes I only use two um, that quick dry oil that I use is by archival oils archival brand and it's called um, odorless lean and it's an alkaloid uh, quick drying medium and it acts very much like linseed oil the difference is that um, it dries quickly which is you know maybe the only downside that oil painting has is that sometimes some colors can dry sort of slow slower than you might want anyway uh, so going in so with one of the things I wanted to get um, across with this painting was kind of playing these blues off the yellows and so you're gonna see the blue never goes into a strong like indigo blue it's always a bit of a cyan -y kind of blue um, and then my other thought was to bring in violets and purples as to kind of counter that and so it's sort of just that's kind of what what I was after with this painting and I'm very happy with the effect I got and uh, certainly happier with this painting than the one that was underneath which frankly I forget but uh, if you were to look at my archives you could find it since I I pretty much a pack rat and I keep I keep everything so um, the other thing you kind of see me doing now is and, and I do this in every sky and if you do any real painting or observing of nature you, you've seen it you know there's always going to be progression in the sky from um, somewhat more saturated darker color at the top of the sky as you go down towards the horizon things become hazier and, and in this case I will introduce a lot of um, yellow ochre into the mixture so it might have a bit of that blue mix a lot more white a lot more yellow ochre the white and the yellow ochre together sort of keep you from going into a full-out 
type of green. Um, yellow ochre is not a super strong yellow. Um, it's a very, very handy color for landscape painting, and it's one of the best. Well, it's great for grass, of course, because it's pretty much the color it is. But it's also very handy for um, skies because it's, um, like I say, it's not super strong, but it gives you that yellowish quality, especially when you mix it in the, with, with the white. It's a good way to go. So if you haven't tried that, give it a whirl. Throw a little yellow, yellow ochre into the lower part of that sky and uh, yeah, you'll dig it. I'm sure you will. Um, also, you can see I'm painting this sky in first, um, and if you've been with me for any time at all, that's something I do very consistently. And uh, the reason I do that is because the trees uh, and everything else is going to be in front of the sky, so it just makes sense as you paint to paint things over the top of things that are behind. It just makes good sense. Um, you can actually develop painting, and some artists do. They just bring up all the different elements together at the same time. And that works too. I've done that sometimes. It's really a matter of personal preference, but uh, you know, this has been working for me this way for a long time, and uh, as I was telling someone um, this morning, you know, there's so many aspects to landscape painting that have to go right for you to get a successful painting that when you have things that work it makes sense to just do them some people uh, in fact i've had people on the channel say oh i'd love to see you do something just crazy and experimental it's like yeah well you know i'm not i'm not young anymore i i don't need to do crazy experimental art when i do art um, it's always with a focused intention and the intention is to create something that is relaxing um to look at and beautiful and um uh, poetic and has a quality that um, sort of resonates um, kind of outside of personality even you know this is what I shoot for and uh, there's a t that's the main goal you know there's a bunch of auxiliary goals which I won't get into um, but you should be aware of why you're painting and what you want to accomplish and who your audience is in my case my audience is um, people that want a beautiful landscape painting uh, are in their lives, you know. Um, and a lot of those people do tend to be artists. A lot of my biggest uh, fans and admirers are artists, and um, I think that's because uh, what I do is sort of functioning at that kind of poetic level, you know. It's, it's not there just to be flash or to be cool. Um, I used to have a job where, I, in fact, I mean, when I was a kid, that was all I cared about was doing something cool, you know. Um, and then as a commercial um, illustrator for many, many years, um, uh, the things I did were designed to trigger a buying response in the um, the public, you know. And my job totally relied on that. In fact, I mean, the company wouldn't stay in business if we didn't have marketable designs. Um, to a large degree, when I got into doing fine art, um, that did not completely go out the window. I feel that I'm still creating stuff that is um, commercially viable, but I realize that the market is far more limited because what I'm doing has a, uh, is only designed to appeal to a certain segment of the um, population, and I'm totally fine with that. Um, but I do have those commercial instincts. They are actually really, really deep in me. Um, uh, after all those years of making a living that way, I, I know that I kind of run counter or, or across it. And in some ways, it's even the case with this channel itself. I know people are interested in sort of remedial painting lessons and things like that. And uh, I've been, I'd be honest, I've been trying to give more information uh, to people um, because you know why not you know I think in fact I've said this before I think if you are somebody that's you know you want to paint you're trying to paint um, it doesn't matter how good you are even you're miles ahead of most people because most people are just spectating they're just on their phones they're playing video games or they're watching endless um, hours of Netflix you know um, if you're taking some time out to try and be creative um, 
individual that's engaged with reality and trying to make something beautiful, um, you have my respect, irregardless of how good your painting is. <laughs> and I have to say this too, if, like, if your painting's not very good, um, just turn it towards the wall and get another one and do another one and do a bunch, you know. I had a lady come into my studio um, the other day and she was, she totally got my work and she was just saying some of the most um, prescient and insightful things about my work, the sorts of th statements that I would have been making. And I, you know, I always know when I'm getting this kind of thing that, that someone's an artist. And I say, oh, you're an artist, aren't you? And she's like, oh, yeah. She's like, but I'm very frustrated because I haven't been working and I've been having health problems. And, and now I'm finding it hard to get back into it. And um, I gave her the same advice that I would give you if you're in that position. And that is to um, have a regular practice of working every day. And, um, you know, there are some traps involved with doing lots of small paintings I can tell you and if you you dig into my 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 history here on the on both my blog and on my videos I I go into that but the benefits far outweigh the traps if you just get yourself a hundred little five by seven boards and make a painting every day you watch how good you're gonna get you know you won't be so worried about those failures because you'll have a, a decent amount of successes at least 10 percent and as you progress on down the line it could be 50 percent or uh, these days, I say I have a success rate of around 75%, maybe 85 you know. I still do paintings that don't work. I still do things that don't work. But I'm always moving, and I'm always cre uh, creating new work. And um, that's the way to get good, and that's the way to counteract this... Uh, um, I wanted to call it a demon, you know, because it's like this mental thing that seizes people and keeps them from working, and... Uh, I say break out of it, you know, you could do a little painting in almost no time. It wouldn't even matter what you paint, I mean, just do a little painting every day. Uh, heck, if you did that for a year, you'd have 350 or 60 uh, paintings. They're not all going to be bad. There's going to be some good ones in there. And I recommend you just throw away the bad ones, and keep the good ones, right? And there you go. Um, so uh, there, w there was one thing I wanted to kind of pass on, and I've, I'm, I know I'm like a broken record. I hit these things all the time, but uh, I do realize that uh, um, people, you know, you, you, there's so many things to look at on YouTube and the Internet. It's like I have uh, a loyal following um, that will check out almost every video I do, but a lot of you tune in and tune out or whatever. And there's always actually I got new subscribers signing up every day, too, so if you've been with me a long time, pardon the repetition, you know, hopefully uh, you get what I'm saying, and I think it's good advice, and uh, the other thing I maybe wanted to touch on a little bit is uh, when you're painting, you want to be mindful, you don't want to be clicking into automatic road, I was, uh, automatic mode, not automatic road, <laughs> you want to be mindful, you don't want to, you don't want to just be what I call, I see this with a lot of uh, new students, new painters, is um, they just, I call it licking, where they just brush, 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 and they're not changing it, nothing's changing, all they're doing is killing anything that was nice about the first few strokes they put down. And a good solution for that, um, it's a little bit extreme, but, but a powerful solution for that if that's one of your problems. Um, and you might not be aware if it's one of your problems or not. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you, with experience becomes more and more obvious is that if you're doing this automatic painting thing, this sort of robotic uh, approach to painting, um, maybe just do a, do a brush stroke and pause and think about it and then do your next stroke. That is a great solution to that problem. And you might go, well, geez, it'll take me forever to do a painting like that. but First of all, if you're doing a bunch of robotic painting, you're doing a bunch of painting that is not good. That if you are are gonna, if it is gonna be good, you'll have to save it. You'll have to fix it. So, just doing a few a mindful stroke that is um, meaningful and it has impact is almost always going to be better than. Um, 20 or 30 unmindful, unconscious strokes. So that's a good solution to that problem. And um, the other, the other less extreme approach is just to sort of envision yourself as a Picasso and really try and paint with flair and energy 
and drama, you know, that's also very effective. Anyway, I can see we're getting sort of close to the end. Don't forget to like the video if you did, and you must if you've been with me for 15 minutes now. Um, so uh, go ahead and do that, and uh, check this out in my store, and um, I'll be back real soon with another video. And uh, meanwhile, I would really appreciate it if you would take good care of yourself, your loved ones, your family, all your friends, co-workers, everyone in your life. And uh, while you're doing that, please stay out of trouble.